Well, so turn with me to 1 Corinthians and to chapter 10. It's lovely to see you all. I've got some bad news for you, though. No pie clips tonight. <laughs> We've locked the doors, though, so you're not going anywhere. <laughs> there will be biscuits. There will be tea. Do feel free to stay around, have a chat, get to know us, and have a biscuit and a cup of... We're carrying on in the book of James this evening, but I want to read from you from 1 Corinthians and from the 10th chapter. I'm going to start reading from the 23rd verse. If you haven't found it already and you're using a church Bible, then page 1135. This is what Paul writes. Everything is permissible, but not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible. But not everything is constructive. Nobody should seek his own good, but the good of others. Eat anything sold in the meat market without raising questions of conscience. For the earth is the Lord's, and everything in it. If some unbeliever invites you to a meal, and you want to go, eat whatever is put before you without raising questions of conscience. But if anyone says to you, this has been offered in sacrifice, well, do not eat it, both for the sake of the man who told you and for, your, and for conscience' sake. The other man's conscience, I mean, not yours. For why should my freedom be judged by another's conscience? If I take part in the meal with thankfulness, why am I denounced because of something I thank God for? So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Do not cause anyone to stumble, whether Jews, Greeks... Or the church of God. Even as I try to please everybody in every way. For I'm not seeking my own good. But the good of many. So that they may be saved. Follow my example. As I follow the example of Christ. Let's turn with me to James and to the fourth chapter. We'll finish this, this chapter tonight, God willing. Say that and you'll see, see why in a short passage of time. I have to apologise as well. I only made one announcement earlier and that was that there are no pikelets. <laughs> there are other things going on in the church. You pick up one of the, um, one of the bulletins <coughs> on the way in and you'll see what's happening. I draw particular attention to the prayer meeting on Wednesday evening, 7.30, Bible study there as well. And there's a, a meeting for, for young mums. Um, on a, on a Wednesday as well. If you want more information about that, uh, just come and see Alison and, and she'll talk to you about that. James chapter 4 then. Tonight we're gardening. I don't know anything about gardening. Uh, if Alison and, and Colin didn't come regularly to the manse, we wouldn't have a garden, we'd have a, a jungle. But um, imagine, imagine a garden, a beautiful garden, one that's looked after. Every week you go out and you dig and you weed, and you prune, and it looks immaculate. But there's a corner that's just tucked out of view that nobody really sees. You can't see it from the house, and so you leave it. You don't really worry about looking after it. You don't tidy it. But if you left it completely alone, if you never went there, well, it wouldn't take long before it overgrew, and it ruined the rest of the garden. In the first part of chapter 4, James has shown us that there is a way back to God for sinning Christians. And that way is humility. But when we come back to God, we cannot continue living as worldly people. And so all of you who are Christians know what I'm talking about. You cut those big things out of your life that are just not compatible with Christian living. And so we work hard then to stop using bad language or coarse joking and with the power of the Lord Jesus we strive to kill addictions and to cut out those bad habits. But there are still corners of the garden that we never go to. There are still parts that we don't weed, parts of our heart that are left un uninspected. And in these little corners of our heart, that's where the little sins grow. Those little weeds. The sins that are never preached about. That are never challenged. But James will not have it. 
if we are to come back to God, if we are to stay close to Him, then we need to be wholehearted in our commitment. It's God's garden, isn't it? You've given your life to Him. It's His heart, and He will not accept sin in any part of it, no matter how dark or distant the corner may be. James is calling you, Christian, tonight to full commitment. And he does this by challenging two sins that we so often fail to address. Let's read this passage and commit the preaching to God in prayer. James chapter 4, verse 11. Brothers, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against his brother or judges him speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you're not keeping it, but sitting in judgment on it. There is only one lawgiver and judge. The one who is able to save and destroy. But you, who are you to judge your neighbour? Now listen, you who say, today or tomorrow we'll go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business, make money. Why well, you do not even know what will happen tomorrow? What is your life? You're a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it's the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast and brag. All such boasting is evil. Anyone then who knows the good he ought to do and doesn't do it, sins. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the truths that we've seen in your word, and particularly in, in James's book as we've studied it. Father, we know that sometimes the lessons have been so hard to apply, and we found ourselves challenged. And as we put ourselves under the lens of your word again, and as the Holy Spirit searches the deep recesses of who we are, oh, soften our hearts. Help us to fix our gaze on the Lord Jesus and on his beauty and on his worthiness. We know that we're sinners. We know that we don't deserve anything from you. We want to be more like our Saviour. So we ask that you change us, make us more like him, we pray. Speak to us, deal with us, minister to us from your word. Not for our sake alone, but for your great glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. James is going to inspect the garden of your heart this evening. <coughs> He's going to particularly take you to two dark corners. And there he will find two invasive weeds, two sins. And he's going to do three things. He's going to tell you what that sin is. <coughs> he's going to tell you why it is so dangerous. And then he's going to tell you what you must do to get rid of it. You see the first weed in verse 11 and 12. It is the sin of gossip. Gossip is one of the most common and least repented sins in the lives of Christians. It affects every one of us. And some of you have been Christians for many, many years. And you, you are still able to talk about your brothers and sisters in an entirely ungodly way. We find it comes so naturally, doesn't it? There is something in us that just wants to talk about ourselves positively and put others down. Our Bibles use an even stronger word than gossip. See it there in verse 11. Brothers, do not slander. That's the word, slander one another. Anyone who speaks against his brother or judges him speaks against the law and judges it. James is talking about the judgments that we make and the things that we say about our Christian family that are not based on God's law or God's word, but purely based on our own preferences and on our own ideas. Not what God says is right, but what I think is right. Next, James shows us why this is so wrong. See, when you became a Christian... 
you became a citizen of the kingdom of God. And you are entitled then to all of its benefits and all of its responsibilities. <coughs> now let me ask you a question. Do you know how free the Lord Jesus has made you? Do you know how free the Lord Jesus has made you? As a member of this kingdom, you, Christian, are at liberty to do whatever you want. That is the way the New Testament talks about it. We read earlier, Paul plays out that conversation, doesn't he, with the Corinthian church. Everything is permissible. <coughs> Not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible. <coughs> Not everything is helpful, constructive. He says you need to be careful what you do. Not everything is going to help you. But he never once questions the truth of that statement. You are free. That is why James calls God's law in chapter 1 the perfect law of liberty. You are free. What does that mean practically? It means this. I, as a Christian man... I'm free to do anything I want, as long as it's not forbidden by God. And so you have no right to criticize me for anything I do, as long as God's word doesn't forbid it. Turn it around. You are free as a Christian man or woman or boy or girl. To do anything except what God's word forbids. And I have no right to stand in this pulpit or stand with a cup of tea and pronounce a negative judgment on you unless you have done something that is against the word of God. If I do that, I am no longer judging you by God's standards, but I'm judging you by my standards, my law. I'm in effect saying that God's law is not good enough to judge you. We need something else. I'm in effect saying that my law, my own ideas are better. As James says there in verse 11, I'm not keeping God's law, but I'm setting myself up as a new lawgiver. I'm setting myself up as the master of both God's law and my brother. I'm actually attempting to replace the Lord Jesus with myself. And now we see how wicked a sin gossip is, don't we? It's treason. That is what it is. It is treason. Attempting to dethrone the king of this kingdom and replace him with myself. Do you know that? Every time you judge your brother and sister according to your own standards, it is an act of treason. It is an attempt to remove King Jesus from his throne and sit on it yourself. All of those throwaway conversations in the car on the way home after church. All of those comments you make to your wife or your husband or a person over coffee. They all overflow from a heart that still aches to be number one. That would rather struggle than submit to your saviour. So our sin has been exposed. James has shone the torch into the little dark corner of our heart that we don't like to admit is still there. We thought it was a victimless crime. But instead it is great rebellion against the king of love. What must we do then? What do we do to put this sin of gossip to death? Well, James has an answer for you. He says you do two things. First of all, you think about who you are. You've set yourself up by gossiping as the new king, the new lawgiver of heaven. Okay. Okay. What kind of king would you make? What kind of power do you have? How wise are you? How much will people rejoice to know that you are now the king?
And I think on what the Lord Jesus. And I think on the Lord Jesus, says James, first of all. There is only one lawgiver. And judge. The one who is able to save and destroy. Who is there like the Lord Jesus? Who can compare themselves with him? Who is as mighty, as awesome, as worthy as him? In this one simple sentence, one look to the Lord Jesus, James cuts through all of our arguments and puts the spotlight on our folly, doesn't he? Who else? Who else is there like the Lord Jesus? Who could save? Who can destroy? Who can pick men and women? Off the threshold of hell. Can you? Who else could make a sinner like me acceptable before the everlasting God? Who else would reach out to a stinking, twisted, deformed child of sin like me in love and promote me to the heights of heavenly glory? Who would go to Calvary for a sinner like me? Would you do that? Would you let your blood splash on the ground as the life seeps from your body to save nobodies like us? Do you look at sinners like us? Do you look at the people who are here tonight with a furious passion? Do you look at this congregation this evening the way the Lord Jesus does? His own precious possession. Well then, who do you think you are, says James, to try and put yourself in the Lord Jesus' place? Look what he says, verse 12. But you, who are you to judge your neighbour? Who do you think you are to judge God's law and to make so little of the very people whom the Lord Jesus treasures? Think on who you are says James. And then secondly, change your language. You see, this is not what your tongue is for, Christian. Your tongue is not for judging each other. It is a tool for Christ's glory. And he has given you two commands that dictate how you should use it. One, love your God. Two, love your neighbor. So your tongue exists for two reasons. And two reasons alone. One, to benefit God. To worship Him. To give Him praise. To give Him glory. To speak for Him. To pray to Him. You use it to tell other people about His goodness to you. And that there is great grace for sinners like them. At the Lord Jesus Christ. Secondly, you use it for the benefit of others. And so you use your tongue to encourage and build up other Christians. You use your tongue for the sake of the person that you are talking to. And the sake of the person that you are talking about. That's the part we forget, isn't it? The moment a Christian's name is on your lips, Christian. You should be thinking, I am speaking now for this person. I am speaking for their benefit, not about them. But for them. That is what I'm doing. How often we forget that. This is not a part of our hearts that we can allow to go unattended. Gossip is a crime against heaven. And many of us need to spend time with our Saviour this evening, repenting of it. But there's another area of our hearts that James wants to consider. Read verse 13. Now listen. You who say today or tomorrow will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. James invites us to listen to a conversation between two Christians. They're talking about the future, where they will go, how long they'll stay there, what they'll do. But they do all of it without any reference to God. How many of us have had conversations like that this week? When should we book our holiday? Where should we build? Where should we buy our, our next home? How long before I retire? What do I need to do this week to ensure the most lambs survive? Good questions. 
right questions, but how many of those questions were asked with reference to your God? say it was foolishness to talk in such a way but it's worse than foolishness look down at verse 16 as it is you boast and brag all such boasting is evil <coughs> to talk about the future with no reference to God James says it is evil and we say well surely that's an overstatement James to think about it like this what were you living for before you became a Christian Regardless of how successful or wealthy you might have been, the best that you could hope for was hell. And so your life was ultimately meaningless. You lived for yourself. The things that you enjoyed most, the things that you loved most, were dead to you when you were dead. You would get no pleasure from them. You were a slave to Satan's kingdom, and yet the Lord Jesus has saved you. He's plucked you from the fire. But he's not saved you to continue living that worthless, meaningless life, has he? He saved you to so much more, he's called you to follow him. And it is a great and worthy calling. You have a saviour to glorify, you have souls to win for his kingdom. There is work to do. And you will enjoy the fruit of your labour for all eternity. We sing, don't we? What a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. Purpose, meaning, a work worth doing. I used to be a farmer, but now I'm a Christian farmer. And as I farm, I do it for the glory of God. I was just a valuer. I was just a freezing worker. I was just a dairyer. I was a clerk, I was a teacher, I was a stay-at-home mum. And the Lord Jesus dealt with me. Made me so much more. He let me keep that job, what I was doing. He gave me gifts. I'm better at it now than I was before. But he's also expanded my horizons. And now I'm useful. And I work for his kingdom. By his grace. I know a higher calling. I am what I am to the glory of God. The king has called you into his service. You know this, don't you, Christian? You're called to serve, to fight a lifelong battle with personal sin, but also against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Christian, it is your immense privilege to be a soul winner. For the Lord Jesus Christ. To engage in that greatest calling that any human being can know. So how can you make plans without bringing this into your reasoning? That is your ultimate goal. The glory of God. How could you plan anything without reference to this? To plan without God is to deny that calling. You're saying, that's not me, that's not my God. It's a denial of God's authority over your life. Like a soldier who ignores the commands of the general and runs away from the conflict. Guilty of treason tonight, brothers and sisters. Guilty of desertion. How's your heart? This is one of the reasons I found this passage so hard to prepare last week. You know, I was hoping to preach this Sunday evening. I just couldn't get there. Such a convicting passage. Don't you feel your heart laid bare? Don't you feel the, the illuminating light of the Holy Spirit's gaze? In those deep corners that so often go left untouched. Does that happen tonight? Have you seen another corner where you feel like you're just failing? What must I do? What must I do to change? James is going to show us. His medicine is the same. First of all, you think of who you are. Look at 
verse 14. Last week, Sarah and I took my friend Ben to Milford. We spent a night in Tiano. And we were looking over the lake. On Tuesday morning, we woke up. Monday, it had been bright sunshine all the way. You could see the mountains. Ben was there snapping away with his camera. But we woke up in Tiano looking over the lake. And it looks like somebody's taken a rubber and a razor and just wiped a whole stretch of the mountains out. The mist has risen from the lake. And you think, oh, well, that's going to ruin all of our photos. It's going to limit our visibility. So we hit the road, and within 45 minutes, it's gone. Just gone. It lifts. The sun burns through it. And it's gone. You're that mist, says James. That's you. Verse 14. Why, you don't even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist. It appears for a little while and then vanishes. You're that mist. Life is so fragile. None of us is guaranteed to see Monday morning. You know that? None of us knows that we'll be there. Who knows when they will die? Who knows when the Lord Jesus will come again? None of us. So how can you make your plans and arrangements without any reference to God. Not one of us can be guaranteed to make it to the end of this sermon. Apart from a movement of God's grace. How much better it would be for those of you who are non-Christians if you understood this. Those of you who tiptoe on the doorstep of heaven. But will never get in. You will never fully commit yourself to the Lord Jesus. Those of you who want to live your own life, and when you're old, and when you're worn out, and when you're tired, oh, then I'll repent, then I'll give myself to the Lord Jesus, you foolish person. This very night, your life may be demanded of you, and you will be stood before a wrathful God in judgment, and you will give an account of your sloppiness and your slowness to accept this Saviour, this Lord Jesus. What are you waiting for? Why are you delaying? If the cross of the Lord Jesus, if his love for you isn't enough, what will it take to warm your heart to him? To cause you to fall on your knees and worship him? It's a great truth that God promises forgiveness to your repentance. But it is equally true that he does not promise tomorrow to your stalling. To those of us who are Christians, we think about who we are. We remember we are dust. We remember we are a vapor. We remember the wind blows and we're gone. And we change our language. Verse 15. <coughs> Instead... You ought to say, if it's the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. Every one of us needs to train ourselves to only talk about the future in the language of heaven. That's what we need to do. You see, the Christian is meant to make plans. You have this high calling. You have this part. This small but wonderfully important part in the work of reaching sinners for the gospel. And if you're going to live a life Christian without planning, how shoddy is that? How poor is that? What love for your Lord and your calling do you have if you don't know what you're doing tomorrow? The Christian is to make plans, but our planning always depends on two things. One, that God wills that we should live. That is the first thing. You see it there in verse 15. If it's the Lord's will, we will live. And so we are always ready to answer this question. Are you prepared to die today? That is how we make our plans. Knowing that at any moment God could call us home. I plan my day. But I must be prepared to accept that it could be my last. I plan my life 
and I live it responsibly. But I must never forget that I am only ever a breath away from heaven. And that it is only the will of God that is keeping me here. Secondly, we make our plans dependent on the fact that God's plan may well be different. See it there. As it is, I'm sorry, verse 15. Instead, you ought to say, if it's the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. Do you get angry when your plans are spoiled? When things change, you get frustrated? Is it not because we always forget that even our best laid plans are subject to the plans of God? That God's timing, His purposes may well be very, very different from what we have planned. But when I recognize that my life, my moments, my hours and minutes are a gift from God, and that His will is always for my best, well, I'll hold my plans with a very loose grip. I'll be able to say with real relief and with confidence, I will do this, I will do that, we'll go there, we'll do this, if the Lord wills. But he may have something better. You know, you'll never have anything worse. That's an amazing thing to think about as you make your plans, isn't it? Whatever you plan, God never has something worse in mind for you. As hard as it is to accept, when things don't go to plan, God never has something worse in life. Always better. His will always better. It's not good enough for Christian people to harbour secret sins in corners of our heart. James has gotten deep into those crevices and exposed these two sins that we so often fail to put to death. And by showing us this, James is calling you, as I said earlier, to total commitment to your God. And he underlines it with this concluding verse, 17. Anyone then who knows the good he ought to do and doesn't do it, sins. You have heard what God expects of you this evening. To not do it is to sin. James has been entirely practical. Hasn't he? All the way through his book, entirely practical, and this evening, no different. He's so down to earth. He has shown us the way back to God and how to stay there. He's given us practical things to do. Remember who you are. Change the way you talk. And the many blessings of doing this are absolutely practical as well. There are many of them for you to work out and to experience. Let me give you three very quickly. First of all, your witness. Imagine how different you would be and how many more opportunities you would have to speak for the Lord Jesus if you never gossiped and whenever you made plans for the future, you made reference to God. Just imagine that. When you spoke about your weekend and your holidays, to your friends in the shed or in the office or wherever you might be. What are you doing this weekend? we will do this on Saturday and that. And then church on Sunday, God wills. If God wills, why do you say that? Well, none of us know when our time's up, do we? No. Oh. It's either a conversation killer or a conversation <laughs> starter, isn't it? <laughs> Our peace and our unity. How much easier would it be as a church? How much sweeter would church life be? How fewer problems would we have? And how much more confident would Christians feel to be in the company of other Christians if we never gossiped and we made our plans for the future, our meetings, our evangelistic plans? and our lives with reference to our God. Knowing that his will may be very different, but will always be better. Finally, your joy. How much sweeter would your very life be, your Christian experience be? How much more would you appreciate your Saviour if you were to put these sins to death 
to be an obedient sheep and follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. And how much more do you appreciate him tonight already? The one who never once gossiped. The one who, whenever he speaks of you, it is to your praise before Father God and in your defence. The one who always made his plans with reference to the will of God, even in obedience to the cross. The same one who stands in your defence tonight and whose perfection you claim. <coughs> Lord Jesus, your blood and righteousness, my beauty are, my glorious dress. Help each one of us to cling closer to you, to put these sins that we convince ourselves <coughs> and our enemy convinces us are so small, so inoffensive, and yet they're great crimes, treason and desertion ignorance of our God. Oh, help us to put them to death. Help us to cast the dearest idol, even ourselves, from the throne of our hearts and worship only our Saviour. For he alone is worthy. In his name we pray. Amen.